Uh, yesterday on the show, I interviewed a man who is campaigning for the world to remove all cluster bombs. He was a good man, a good guy, really. We disagreed in some areas, but, well, that's just the way it is. It was a civilized disagreement, I think. And I, too, desire a world where there is no need for cluster bombs, no need for mines, no need for any such weapons. They're fearsome, but you know what? They, they do work. But notice, please, the nuance of language and of what I said. I used the phrase, no need. Imagine a world with, with, with no Nazi despots, no Marxist thugs, no Islamic fundamentalist theocrat madmen, no invaders, no bullies. It's a noble dream, but uh, it's not a reality, is it? Of course, many countries have agreed to eliminate cluster bombs, but <laughs> they're the countries least likely to use them or make them. Those that do make and will indeed use Russia, China, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, North Korea and so on, they won't sign the treaty at all, meaning that all the cluster bomb document does is to put the civilized world at a disadvantage. It disarms the peaceful and the peacemaker, enables the aggressor and the bellicose. It's always been that way, of course. We have this argument every year, don't we, when we remember the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Well, they bang a huge gong in Japan and peaceniks do their usual pretentious thing. We're all supposed to mouth the usual relativist nonsense about the West having no right to, to speak or condemn other people. Oh, golly, look, we have every right to condemn other people and we had a perfect right to drop those bombs as well. I'll tell you a story here. Never knew. I never knew my, my mum's uncle Billy. He was the youngest of my mother's uncles. There were quite a few and, and the one who everybody loved. Always had the girls around him, always had that movie star smile and the looks to match. That's what they said about him. He just turned 17 when he volunteered. Yeah, he volunteered for the British Army because he was fit, tough and, and eager. And Billy became an infantryman. And within a very short time, he was posted overseas. Nobody was supposed to know where and everybody did. It was east, very east. His mum cried at the thought of her little boy going so far away. She also cried when she received the telegram telling her that Billy had been captured and was a prisoner of war. Don't cry, love, her husband said. He's better off out of it. It'll be over within the year and he'll be back home with us. It lasted more than the year and Billy never came home. He died in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. His family didn't know until the war was over, though. For more than three years, while Billy's family had hoped and prayed, Billy had been lying in a shallow grave in a faraway place. It was only when the camps were liberated and when the other prisoners were released that the truth came out and the stories of what went on in Asia were revealed. Torture, executions, beatings, humiliations, slavery, crucifixions, starvation. Men worked to death building roads and bridges for the Japanese war effort, denied basic food and health care and living in filth. Some of the crimes, by the way, are infamous. Others, though, coming to light only now. Beneath this bare bitumen car park could lie the victims of one of Japan's vilest wartime atrocities. It's alleged that here in the heart of Tokyo, Japanese scientists infected prisoners with diseases such as plague and cholera. Some were then dissected alive to determine the effects of pathogens on the body. We are going to evacuate about 3,000 square metres. We want to know if there are human remains buried here. Kazuyuki Kawamura has been campaigning for years for this site to be dug up, saying Japan has to confront its wartime atrocities. This is the site of the Army's Medical Academy. This institute had close ties with Unit 731. We have a duty to unearth the truth. No good or bad or right and wrong in war? Spare me. But back to Billy. His friends remembered him but couldn't recall how he died. There was so much death, so much pain. One young man's passing just didn't register. And Billy was one of thousands. British, Canadian, Australian, New Zealander, American, Dutch, Chinese, Korean. 
Men beheaded or buried alive, some strung up in cages to die in the heat and then be thrown to the sharks. Women raped and slaughtered, used as sex toys for Japanese troops. Of course the atomic bombs were horrific. But if Allied lives were saved by those bombs, I cannot condemn the actions. Could I have looked into the eyes of a mother or wife and explained that her husband, her son, would have to die fighting the Japanese on their own soil? No. Therefore, I cannot now, in the comfort of and safety and security of modern times pass judgment on those who use the ultimate weapon of war against the Japanese. There is such a thing as good and bad, right and wrong. And in the Second World War, the Allies were on the side of light. The same applies to the West today. Make the world peaceful, sure. Eliminate all types of bombs if we can, of course. But we can't, you know. Now, you know that, I know that, and the bad guys, they really know that. These are inhumane, indiscriminate, and unacceptable weapons. All parties, all parties agree that cluster munitions should be banned. Unfortunately, the current Bill C-6 seriously undermines the convention. It would undermine Canada's reputation in the world, and it would reduce Canada's credibility and influence on the international stage. Absolute nonsense. Cluster bombs, landmines, we've had such weapons, relatively low tech really, for a very long time. But Canada now faces lots of lefty pressure to sign on to the latest trendy treaty. That doesn't mean, however, that we should be so hasty to completely eliminate them from our, ars from our arsenal. Now, Sun News contributor John Robson, well, like no other, he investigates. Does anybody even remember the landmine treaty? Uh, that might seem like a fatuous question with the usual do-gooders, including the CBC all gaga about how 15 years ago Canada led the world in banning landmines. Now we seem to be dragging our feet on cluster munitions. Boo hiss down with that war like Stephen Harper. But I find all of this odd because in the newspapers that I read, the last decade or so has been full of IEDs exploding, maiming or killing our soldiers in Afghanistan, killing and wounding Americans in Iraq, devastating civilians. And after, I mean, what's an IED? It's just a homemade landmine, right? So where's the outcry on that? They seem to be a weapon of choice among the bad guys, along with car bombs and suicide belts. Instead, we're being told, oh, no, it's cluster bombs. Former Australian Prime Minister just told our parliament that if you want to kill women and children, cluster munitions are the weapon of choice. That's not even true. What about car bombs? What about those suicide vests? That's what's really killing civilians and doing it on purpose. Because why don't these people want to ban all weapons? I mean, is it better to be killed by a hand grenade or an airstrike? Even World War I shells still go off occasionally and kill some poor soul in France or Belgium who's minding his own business. Why don't they want to ban all weapons? Well, the funny thing is they probably wouldn't mind if we got rid of all of ours, but they don't seem that concerned about the bad guys. Same thing with the landmine treaty. They're all in high dudgeon because the United States didn't sign it. Well, neither did Russia, neither did China, neither did Iran. Aren't you worried about those people? Why hasn't the United States signed it? Why aren't they willing to ban cluster munitions? Well, I'll tell you, it's because they're getting ready to fight the bad guys on our behalf. We're not willing to arm. If we do go to war, it'll have to be with the Americans. And that brings me to the particular issue that's come up. In passing legislation to implement the cluster munitions ban treaty, the Harper government is going to exempt our forces if they're engaged in joint operations with people who use cluster munitions. That means the United States. And apparently this is sort of terrible. But why? I mean, what are these weapons even for? I remember years ago I was editing the memoirs of a guy who landed with the Stormont Dundas Glengarry Highlanders on D-Day and fought his way through Northern Europe in World War II. And he wrote his memoirs, which I helped edit, and at one point he had a throwaway line about putting down the regiment in a defensive position for the night, and I said, Reg, I don't know what that means, you've got to give me some details. So he did me a bunch of diagrams and transparencies, including here's where you put the temporary minefields. If you're attacked by the 12th SS or some other very nasty group of individuals, you can't hold them off without these things. And the same thing is true today. If faced with a numerically superior enemy, American forces and our forces need ways to stop them. In the 1980s, the plan to keep the Red Army from overrunning Western Europe without having to resort to nuclear weapons was to use artillery-based cluster munitions to lay down fields of bombs that the Red Army tanks couldn't get through. Was that a bad thing? Would you rather we use nuclear weapons or just ran up the white flag in the face of Leonid Brezhnev? It's not about making the world a safer place. 
It's weird, but it's about making the West less safe. And whatever you are when you advocate that, you're not the good guys. Well done, sir. But, but John, that Sherman tank behind you, it didn't actually fire at you, did it? No, luckily it didn't. Uh, <laughs> not, <laughs> if they'd wanted us to leave, they could have made a dramatic expression of their wishes, but they didn't. It's very interesting. We've seen this when people protest in favour of peace, sort of the Mennonite approach and the peacenik approach. It's always wanting the West, the Americans, the Canadians, the British, the Israelis, to come to the peace table while the Soviets or the Russians, Chinese and the rest of them do their own thing. It's naked hypocrisy. Yeah, it is. It's very curious. I remember it even provoked uh, François Mitterrand, who was not perhaps the most uh, bellicose or pro-American individual. When the Soviets had filled Eastern Europe with intermediate-range nuclear missiles, and Ronald Reagan was threatening to respond by deploying some American ones, and there were this, this huge peace marches and everything, a lot of which were in fact funded from strange sources, yeah. and Mitterrand said, why is it that all the missiles are in the East, but all the protests are in the West? <laughs> and this question comes up again and again and again. Why are they so focused on weapons that our forces would need not to be overrun by the enemy in the event of a conflict with the bad guys. And why? Given the legitimate concern that these munitions might remain after the battle and hurt people, why aren't they campaigning for cluster munitions whose fuses degrade quickly? Mm -hmm. There are technical ways that we can make these things less dangerous to civilians. Where's that? Why instead are they saying we must throw down our weapons and they're not remotely concerned about what the Iranians or the Chinese are doing? And then um, Vladimir Bukovsky, Soviet dissident, once wrote that he said Western liberals are like the backward dog in Russian folklore, that they wag their tail at strangers and bark at their own family. And you run into this, especially with the peace movement, with puzzling frequency. Mm. Why were they never concerned about the buildup of weapons by their Warsaw Pact? All those tanks ready to roll. What were they for? They were to conquer Western Europe. Why wasn't that an issue? Why was it only our response that was an issue? And in the 30s, again, they didn't look at Hitler. They just looked at the West and said, oh, 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 Churchill's a warmonger. Right word, wrong person. Mm. Now, that's very true because it was an open secret that the Germans under the Nazis were rearming. The Air Force was declared, a military navy was declared. We knew it was happening, but if you read the accounts of the time from uh, red Anglican bishops down to red university students, it was all about how Britain and the Allies, Commonwealth Empire, should not rearm. Now, we had on the show yesterday someone who I don't think is a, is a, a bad guy, Paul Hannon, who has, who has been quite active in this field. I think he has a, a decent intent, but I'm not sure if he's going about it the right way and we chatted for one I want to play a clip of this now and get you to respond let's see it please it, there is a clause it's called clause 11 I wouldn't consider it a compromise I would consider it a, a step backwards perhaps going back on the word that Canada gave the international community when it negotiated the treaty and said that it would not interpret uh, an article in the convention that it pushed for mm. uh, as a loophole and we would see this clause clause 11 as actually being a loophole because it permits uh, Canadian forces personnel in combined operations to not only assist other forces who may not be party to the treaty, uh, but to also request use of their cluster munitions and to, in certain circumstances, use them ourselves. If we add country by country by country and stigmatize this weapon, we will, we will stop other people from using them. It's the same thing happened with landmines. But it hasn't, of course. And uh, Russia and China, the, the major powers, they couldn't care less what we say and what we do. Yeah, stigmatize. If we've stigmatized landmines, why do these IEDs keep going off all yeah. over the place? Why are vicious terrorists blowing people up with reckless disregard for civilians using homemade landmines? And what is this international community of which he speaks? If you look at the UN, you look at the thugs and wretches who dominate the votes there, you know, the organization of the Islamic conferences, they're all down with Israel, death to Israel, death to Israel, death to Israel. There's your international community. Mm. Is China and Russia your international community? Iran, Syria, is this your international community? It makes it sound like we're there with a bunch of good guys and we're the bully. It's a preposterous misrepresentation, but that language gets used so often people start thinking there is an international community. There's not, there's a bunch of sovereign states, most of them of dubious or non-existent democratic legitimacy, in, frequently engaged in aggressive policy, building up weapons, preparing to strike at their neighbors in order to distract attention from how wretchedly they're governing their own people. There is no international community, so you shouldn't talk about promises we didn't make to it anyway. Mm. I asked him during that interview, uh, countries which had used cluster bombs recently, asked him about the Dutch, for example, and he said, obviously in a condemning, pejorative manner, well, the Dutch have you, they, they use them in Kosovo. Now, I, I didn't approve of the Kosovo mission, but that's held up as the poster boy for international intervention, so their arguments aren't even consistent. 
yeah, exactly. We did a humanitarian thing and it worked and now we feel terrible about ourselves. Yeah, maybe the Dutch should have stood aside. Maybe they should have done as was done in Rwanda and just say, oh, well, rather than employ these awful weapons, we'll just let you do this. As though, you know, mankind were in a death struggle with weapons and Canada was on the side of weapons, as opposed to good people facing bad people who think nothing of using the most dreadful weapons if it gives them an advantage. Mm. The only reason Hitler didn't use chemical weapons, well, there's two reasons in World War II. One is they're unreliable. Two, he was afraid the Allies would yes. retaliate. That, but that, there was no, oh, somebody stigmatized them. Oh, well, then, hey, Mr. Hitler, obviously, once something stigmatized, he would never do it. That's so well put. People need to remember this. Hitler, not a nice man. The only reason Hitler didn't use chemical weapons, and in fact, Britain, of course, gas masks everywhere, they were ready for it, is because Churchill made it completely clear, if you do, we will as well. Good stuff. Really appreciate your work. Thank you so much, my friend.